For the past several years, substance abuse has been steadily rising with the abuse of prescription drugs, now an even more serious problem than the abuse of illegal drugs. The U.S.-New Mexico border state of New Mexico has over double the rate of deaths due to drug overdose compared to the rest of the United States. In other border states, the abuse of both illegal drugs and prescription medications is also a serious problem of adolescents as well as young adults. Beginning to abuse substances is like lighting a match. Sometimes you don't know what you've done until everything is out of your control. This program is divided into four segments. How did this happen to me? Is this really my life? How can I break free? And will you hear us? I'd like to introduce you to the five people who will be sharing their lives with you today. Carlos is a current meth addict from Las Cruces. We first met him at the Department of Health building while he was trying to exchange needles. Erica was married to a meth addict for years and experienced a roller coaster of emotions and struggles before he finally passed in 2009. Jamie is a recovered prescription pill and heroin addict whose daughter was taken from her by Children's Protective Services. She has been persevering to regain custody of her daughter while working with the court system through her addiction. Ashley is a recovered heroin addict from Albuquerque who now advocates harm reduction and works with various programs after her difficult journey through addiction. Our final interviewee prefers to stay anonymous, but is passionate about sharing his experiences with struggling through an addiction to prescription pills. Listen closely to their words, and maybe one will strike you in your heart. How did this happen to me? As far as our patients go, um, we have a variety of um, patients who are addicted. Um, a lot of them um, is due to self-medication, I believe. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, people that are gang members. And then we also have the people um, that have gotten addicted in a legitimate way. Um, and by this I mean that uh, they have been prescribed medications to help them with pain and um, their tolerance is, is driven to where they need to have more. They go from having two pills a day to having needing three, four. So um, we have a variety of um, reasons why people are, you know, in, in our program for the addictions. So there isn't, um, there isn't a particular thing that, that does it. I was seven years old when I first tried marijuana. And why, why did you try it there? Because my older cousin was getting high and he told me to take a hit. <laughs> did you like it? Uh, yeah, I kind of didn't know what the hell it was going to do to me. And then um, I really don't remember the rest of the night. Just fell asleep. And if it's a girl doing it to you for the first time, run. Cause that's what got me. It's like a girlfriend. Some girl, model, at a concert. I had a concert with a couple guys, Frankie J and Baby Bash and them, and went to the after party and this girl, beautiful girl. I didn't have a pipe to smoke. And she's like, it's okay, mijo, I'll take care of you, mijo, and this and this. And next thing I know, I crystal meth in my blood and psh, changed my life forever, October 2011. You learned something new every time you talked to him. He was just that kind of person, like he was just super cool. So we ended up dating and um, I ended up getting pregnant right away. And a few months after I found out I was pregnant, his father was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, he ended up passing really quickly. Um, like, I believe it was like, we found out in September and by April he passed. So it was real quick. Well, that led to him using again. So um, after that, uh, I met a total different 
Damien. His name is Damien, by the way. Well, I guess it kind of all started when I had my daughter. Um, when I was 20, I got pregnant with my daughter, Charlize, and um, right after I had her, I had a, I had a really bad surgery where um, I guess I almost died. They gave me a blood transfusion. They left a piece of placenta inside of me, and as soon as I had my daughter, it was just, it was crazy. I felt like I was back in labor again. And um, they had given me the epidural a couple of times and messed up. And as soon as everything was okay the next day, I mean, they were giving me painkillers when I was having my daughter, but um, they sent me home with like a prescription of painkillers and I just kept taking them, even when like the pain went away and I kept taking them. I guess I, I didn't really know that you could get addicted to anything like that. I was really, I don't know, blind. I didn't know. And um, when all my painkillers ran out, I got really sick and I didn't know what was going on, and my husband didn't understand it either. I just kept taking painkillers. I bought them from other people, or he would buy them from other people. And really, they had started me on a really small painkiller, and I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know why I was sick, why I felt the way that I did. I just knew that I didn't want to feel like it anymore. So. I did everything that I could to find any, I was on lower tabs and I did anything I could to find more lower tabs and then I had been introduced to other things like higher um, painkillers like oxys and Percocets and um, I just basically did anything I could do to take them for almost three years. My mom knew about it and I had a problem and I knew that I had a problem, I just, I couldn't go a day without taking them, I'd be sick and I couldn't move or do anything. So what caused me to use drugs in the first place, or began using drugs in the first place, is a culmination of things. Um, I think it's the lack of coping mechanisms to deal with everyday stress. Uh, I feel like addicts may be a particular group of people that do not have the same kind of um, stress coping mechanisms that kind of the normal populace might maintain normally. So I know it, that was a big reason for me. Um, the group of people that I was around started using heroin before I did. I was kind of the last in our group to pick it up. I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me um, who actually was addicted in shooting up before I was. So that kind of played a lot into it. I also, I wanted to see what everybody was doing and what was the big deal with heroin. Um, I'm gonna say started using drugs was gonna have to be when I started using opiates, my, my drug problem, my uh, problem drug, my drug of choice, the drug that caused my problems. So uh, um, when I st first experimented with it, it was because my roommate is d was uh, had a disabled roommate who had medicine, and I asked him to give me something to go to sleep. Um, he gave me a morphine because, and doctors still haven't answered this question for me, uh, it, it, it did not put me to sleep. It gave me energy. It uh, picked me up, made me feel great. I, I felt like f***ing Superman. Uh, so um, I discovered this and realized um, I liked that. And um, the thing about taking a prescription medication is it doesn't occur to you that it's as addicting. Like I said, my only other experience with drugs was marijuana. And and that's illegal. And, and in D.A.R.E. class and Yes to Life and all these drug anti-drug classes, they tell you, that drug is is, uh, is 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 bad. It's so bad, and I'm thinking, okay, well, how can prescription drugs be worse than uh, street illegal street drugs? Young adults are the largest group of prescription drug users for non-medical purposes. More youth die of prescription drug overdoses than any other drugs, including heroin and cocaine combined. Three types of prescription drugs are abused most often. Opioids, prescribed for pain relief. Central nervous system depressants, barbiturates and benzodiazepines, often referred to as sedatives or tranquilizers. Stimulants, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or obesity. It is a crime to possess class A drugs, heroin, morphine, codeine, prescription drug, ketamine, Special K. Class A punishments. First offense, up to 10 years in state prison. Second offense, up to 15 years. It is a crime to possess Class B drugs. Cocaine, crack, amphetamines, prescription drug, methadone, prescription drug. 
Class B punishments. First offense, up to 10 years in state prison. Second offense, more than 10 years. Is this really my life? You know, we have 17 year olds and then we have grandpas that are, you know, 70 and retired. We have people that are professionals in our community, whether it be, you know, instructors or engineers. Um, and then, you know, we also have the people that come straight from the county jail. So um, there, there isn't, there isn't, a, you know, one particular thing that stands out. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, this is not a disease that affects a particular person. Um, it is, it is, uh, it affects everybody. It doesn't matter what their, you know, what their income is or professional, how old they are. Again, you know, it, it, it just, it varies. It's like a cup of coffee in the morning. Chemical dependency means that it's needed, it's a necessity. It's like breakfast, it's like water to your body. If I don't have amphetamine, Adderall, just amphetamine itself, it doesn't have to be meth. As if I don't have it, if I don't get it, um, I won't get out of bed, I'll just be all depressed, suicidal, you know, broken down. My son's 350 miles away from here, and I went there three times in the past year and a half with my own money. All my money's gone. You know what I mean? And it's not easy being away from him, especially on Father's Day or days like that, you know. But I have a lot to, I have a lot on my cross and I'm still carrying it. The kind of hallucinations he would have, like he called me one night and he said he was in a closet in this house and there was a dead woman in a bed, but there was a shrine built to her and the residents of this house were her kids, and he's like, they worship her dead body, and I'm in the closet, and I, I was like, leave, you know, just leave, I can't leave. And then a few days later, he'd call and he'd be like, oh yeah, I, I got this guy, you know, I met this drug dealer, and I let him get me high all the time, I'm getting free drugs, and all I gotta do is drive him around. And I was like, um, Okay, I'm sorry. Like, so you're his bitch because he's using you for your car. He's just keeping you doped up. No, 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 no. I'm getting all the free drugs I can. And then the next thing, the next call was like, please help me. I need to get home. I'm scared. Like, these people are freaking. I mean, it. you just didn't know. You never knew what he was going to call and say. We were drinking, and we got into a fight, and I called the police. When they showed up, they took our daughter and they put him in jail and they wanted to put me in the hospital. So after a couple months of being in CYFD and doing everything that they wanted us to do, I had got a really bad ear infection and my ear had bulged out. I, I don't know what was wrong with it, but I went to the emergency room and it was really bad and it hurt and they gave me some painkillers and I knew once they gave it to me, I was like, man, I knew what they were, I knew everything about them. And I went and filled them anyway, and I took them, and I went back after a couple of days. It still was huge, and they gave me more of them. After those ran out, I didn't know anybody out here who did drugs or did anything. It was kind of like my move to South Carolina. It was, I could either choose the same path or, you know, try to fix things. And I found the same friends, but I couldn't find any painkillers. The only thing I found out here was heroin, and I knew that it was an opiate, and I knew that it would make me not sick. So that's when I started using heroin. I used it for a couple of months. Drugs and alcohol became a problem for me when I realized that I was unable to maintain everyday normal life type things, like things such, so simple as feeding yourself or taking care of putting gas in the car, you know, sweeping your floor. Just when I looked around and noticed that I lived in squalor and that I was a heroin junkie and, you know, or even back before that when I was drinking, there was things kind of even then falling apart a little bit. But as my addictions progressed into full-blown heroin addiction, every, every step of the way more and more things fell apart or I lost more and more. I used to call them, they were morphine pills or little brown pills, and uh, I used to call my little cup of coffee um, because it would pick me up when I got up. So um, it doesn't take long to get addicted to opiates. About a month of straight use every day, you're hooked, you're done. I mean, y y you can get over it, but um, when you stop taking it, you're, sh 
you're puking, you're, you are in, you're a prisoner of your own body. It's awful. Um, so that's an addiction. Um, so I guess that's how I just, I was ignorant to it. I, I didn't think it was going to be like that. And, um, the rest is history. Um, I was going to school and working, so it was difficult to be able to stop or get an opportunity to stop because you need about a good solid week where everybody just leaves you the hell alone to detox. My son is everything to me and just having him will make me happier than anything, you know. Yeah, I can go to Texas and see him, but I don't have money to keep coming back and forth and paying for hotels and gas and, you know, food. You know, my, my drugs, I mean, weed, you know. If, if I could say anything to any kid out there that, that's thinking about doing drugs or is already addicted to meth, don't ever put a needle in your vein. Okay. Just don't. And if it's a girl doing it to you for the first time, run. Because that's what got me. He, um got involved with some really, really bad people. He was using a lot, and he started shooting up in Albuquerque, and that's when things got really crazy. He would, I would wake up in the middle of the night, um, and he'd have the camera taking pictures of dark corners and piles of clothes and saying there was people hidden in our house, and um, he would, uh, there was a time where I woke up and he was stabbing the mattress right next to me with our daughter in the bed because he was determined that there was a man I was hiding between the mattresses. And I mean a big old knife. It wasn't a little one. It was a huge knife. Um, the worst thing that happened in Albuquerque was uh, one morning I found some meth and it was a huge baggie and it's not cheap. And we were already struggling because of his habit and everything. And I found the baggie. I got upset and I threw it down the drain. Well, he went off. I just remember him coming towards me. And that's all I remember. And then he moved back and he looked at me and his eyes were like, oh, shit. and then he left. He took off. And I yelled at my older daughter, you know, lock the door, don't let him in. And she came to the bathroom and she's like, you're bleeding. And I said, no, baby, I'm just crying. I'm, I'm freaking out. It's OK. She's like, no, you're bleeding. He tried to bite my nose off. Yeah, it was about a couple months. And they drug tested me, and they noticed that I had opiates in my system. And it was a really big deal. Whenever you're in these programs, you go to court once a month, and they keep track of if you broke a curfew or if you failed a UA and what's going on. And, Every UA from the beginning of the program to about three months in, I had failed for opiates. And I told them it was my prescription, it was my painkillers. And they looked a little bit further into it and they found like morphine in it. And I guess it shows up as morphine also. So that's where I couldn't lie anymore. I had went to court twice and the judge was like, I don't know, he, he gave me an option to do a 24-hour self-surrender, and at that time I had just come out and I told everybody I have a problem, you know, like I have to use this every day when I get up. I walk to work, I work, you know, 40, 45 hours a week, I try to work as much overtime as I can, and I'm sick, I do it sick, you know, or not, and I would get up even earlier to go get my drugs before I went to work, to go to work and be able to work through the day. Um, I had money that was given to me by my family, unfortunately. Um, I never really had to steal because I had access to money, which was a really big mistake that my parents and my grandparents made, was making sure that I had a nonstop flow of cash um, to the point where I, at one point, I think went through $12,000 in a month. And then that's, it was only then that they actually started kind of wondering where things were going. Damien was a very cocky person. He said, what would you do if I would, um, if I would ever kill myself? And I told him that would be the most selfish thing you could ever do to your kids. He told me, I know my kids are going to be OK because you're stronger. I can tell you're stronger. And I was like, yeah, I am stronger. And so a few weeks went by, um, and then, uh, one day, he, uh, I was outside cleaning my car, and um, I remember hearing a car on, 
And then um, all I remember is standing up, getting out of the car and standing up. And over my car, I could see his car. And I thought, oh, God, here we go again. You know, like I had to get to work. So I was looking and he wasn't moving. All I saw was the top of his head. And um, so I started backing away from my car, but I was walking backwards because he was scary and he had attacked me before so I was just being cautious and I noticed he was leaning like this but when I saw his face his eyes were closed so my first instinct was he came over here and shot up you know like how dare he come over here and do this in, in front of you know so I started walking backwards well while I was walking backwards his body started like shaking like convulsing and I thought oh my god he's overdosing and so from his body moving so much it shifted and it went this way and when it when his head hit the window it just hit and there was just blood everywhere and I was just like oh my god he's overdosing so I ran I, I went inside still backwards and my kids were right there <clears throat> and my niece was there, and uh, my little one, his daughter, said, is my daddy dead? And I said, no, babe, he's sick. I need to call, I need to call the hospital so they can come take him to the hospital. Finally, after a while, a cop comes in, two detectives, and I'm asking them, why isn't anybody taking him out? Why aren't they taking him to the hospital? And they're looking at me like I'm crazy, and they're like, um, he's dead and I was like no he's not like he's overdosing and they said no he's dead what and I said they said he they, they told me that he had shot himself but I didn't remember hearing gunshots uh, basically some things that I that stick out really clearly in my mind that I do kind of tell I think younger generations about a lot is how dangerous it is for a female to be in the lifestyle of using, buying, selling anything involving, you know, hard drugs such as heroin, cocaine, meth. Uh, there was several times that drug dealers had threatened me, you know, with things like rape, uh, murder. You know, I watched friends of mine getting raped before. I've had, you know, people carjack me things like that, um, but I mean, I don't, luckily nothing really too bad ever happened to me, but yeah, those are mainly the things that stick out in my mind that I tell people about is, you know, stupid things we did to support a habit or, you know, things like that. Uh, after about a year and a half of taking what becomes negative is, um, it starts having an opposite effect. Um, you start, um, it, it, it's still energizing to have it, but, after that, you start to notice um, you, you sleep more. Um, like you can you can get up, but you can knock out 12 hours of sleep no problem because uh, it makes you comfortable. So um, that's that's extremely negative. Um, depression starts to become a factor too, which it states on the on the bottles too uh, for opiates. But this is from long term use when it's already too late. Um, maybe about a for me maybe about a year year and a half into it that's when the depression might start setting in. And it's a realization of a few things. Like I was saying, the realization that if I were to get away from my supplier, um, I would be in a world of shit. So um, that in itself, the realization of that is depressing because you can't go on a vacation. Um, you know, I have family that lives up in Washington. To go see them for a month, it would be difficult for me to smuggle a month's worth of pills up to Washington. So that way I could stay stable out there long enough to they, they wouldn't know that anything was wrong with me. Um, so, um, that's, that's the factor. The dependency is, 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 is overwhelming and that sucks. So, and, and you know, you don't need it. Drug related deaths now outnumber gunshot deaths in America. More people die from a drug overdose than motor vehicle accidents. Teens who abuse drugs are more likely to have poor judgment, which can lead to unsafe sex resulting in pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections. Cocaine and methamphetamine are linked to paranoia and death from heart attacks and strokes. Heroin use can result in slow and shallow breathing, convulsions, coma, and death. 
How can I break free? Medication, obviously, which is what our program offers, and always, always the mental health part of it because it is an addiction. To me, therapy is one of the biggest things that you can do um, to try and curb that addiction. Um, we can give you all the medication in the world, but if you don't know how to process it or um, treat it differently, um, if you do the same things over and over again, you're not gonna succeed. You need, um, you need someone to teach you how to um, deal with um, processing. How do I, how can I think differently? You know, how do I get rid of this anxiety? How do, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm starting to want to use, you know, how do you, how do you change those ways? So to me, the therapy is the most vital part of it. Absolutely. Um, but the medication is also there to help with that anxiety, the cravings, the illness that comes with the withdrawing. Um, so those two things really, um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty vital to me. I see people, they clean, they get clean, yeah. healthy. And I don't know where I go to a spot at two, three in the morning, pocket full of dope, pocket full of money. And look who I see, the person I saw clean two months ago, three months ago. It's a ricochet, man. It's hard, it's not easy. And the only way it's gonna stop is if, is if we, you know what I mean? Let the youth know that, that it's not the way to go, you know what I mean? If you care about your family and your children, your brothers and sisters and your parents, you know, say no. It's that easy. And I, you know, I was off drugs, I was sick, and I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was, and it really wasn't. I think it was a mental thing. I was determined. After years of being sick and being on drugs, it was really, you know, like you, when you want something, you really want it. I followed through with a lot of things in my life and I knew that I could get off of this. I just needed to get off of it and get away from it for the sake of my daughter, you know. So I went in there and I was determined to get clean and they checked me. They don't do anything for you at the jail. They don't give you Suboxone. They don't give you Tylenol. They won't give you anything there. They say, um, they'll call you down to medical maybe two, three times a day. They'll check your blood pressure and a couple other things. As long as you're not having seizures, they're not taking you to the hospital. And I watched a guy, everybody in jail seemed to be getting off of drugs. And I watched a guy have a seizure and they didn't do anything about it. So I was like, you know, I'm not going to have a seizure or freak out. I'm just going to get over this and I'm going to get through it. And I did. I did the whole 10 days and I got released and I was determined when I got out of jail to just stay clean. And I knew that once I got out of the 10th day, if I went back to doing it, I was going to be right back there. I have never been criminally charged with anything in my life. I've never been to jail. That was really hard for me. It was a really hard learning experience. I mean, it kind of it hit home, though, you know? I was in there for 10 days, and it's not, I mean, it's not really too hard, but you don't really know what you have until you're without it, and I... I've never, I don't know, I just, it just didn't make sense to me. I was sitting in jail with a bunch of people who were there for months and some people who just needed to pay to get bonded out and some people who have done really bad things and they're all asking me what I'm doing here and I guess I'm just here to get off of drugs, but I was treated just like everybody else, you know. Um, I actually got pregnant in 2009 and I now have a three-year-old daughter. She's gonna be four in October. And when I found out I was pregnant, that was, uh, I knew I had to stop using and I told myself, I'll stop using at least during my pregnancy. And with the right help and the right support, and I think I had my head on straight and everything, I, I was able to stop and I've, you know, continued my recovery from there on out. Yeah, I, I abandoned almost everyone I had grown up with because almost all of them were either in prison, they're on the streets, or so a lot of them now are, have passed away. I told you I was laying on the railroad tracks earlier. I'm done. On my birthday, I mean, by myself. I don't want it was a steak. I still want a steak. I mean, I ate. I'm, I'm good. But I just wanted a home and cook and nice steak, potatoes and corn and, you know. And like, I mean, why did it? Why does anybody even have to celebrate their birthday for? You know. It's just another day. Once you experience that high, you know what it does to you. You know that you can go to get it to get that high. 
and, and in some cases you might even think you'll be able to control it. Oh, I'll just use today and just as long as I don't use every day, I'll be okay. But you, you just gotta realize that it's, it's, that's not realistic. Um, that's, it's, um, you can do that, but you're playing with fire, so why do that? Um, once I let my family know, because nobody knew I hit it when I got off, once I let them know, um, I think now they're more aware of it, so now I basically wouldn't be able to hide it either, you know, because they're aware of it. So, um, but so I guess family, and then mostly, like I said, I got I got a kid now, so that's that's a huge motivation for me uh, to not to not do drugs. I mean, that's because uh, you know if I I fuck up, then uh, he probably won't ever know me or something. I don't know. Be honest about your drug use. When you have a drug use problem, it can be easy to downplay or underestimate how much you use. Talk to family members and friends and ask for support. Take a family member or friend along when you go to seek help. Make a list of medications, drugs, illegal or prescription, and anything else that you're taking and give it to your health provider. Anybody that might need some help, uh, there are several websites. There's one called heretohelp.org and it provides uh, a lot of information for the states throughout the whole United States, for individual states and cities on mental health and addictions, um, how to contact any clinics or physicians that might be available. Uh, the other thing also is our Southwest Path Southwest Pathways program. We have a website as well um, and it'll give you the information as well. It'll give you phone numbers, uh, who to call, and um, always your physician. It, sometimes the physician is the first line for us um, as far as seeking help. Talk to your physician. Um, if you are someone that goes for uh, counseling or therapy, talk to them as well. Addiction is a complex but treatable disease. No single treatment is appropriate for everyone. Matching treatment settings, interventions, and services to an individual's particular problems and needs is critical to his or her ultimate success. Treatment needs to be readily available. The moment people are ready for treatment is critical. Potential patients can be lost if treatment is not immediately available or readily accessible. Will you hear us? Look at me. I mean, I'm half past dead, and I ain't got nothing left except my family, my brothers and sisters, and my son. And even them, they don't want me around. They wish they had me around. Let's take everything in stride. Don't look at anything bad as bad. There's always something good and a good message and teaching through everything you go through. Um, nothing is in vain. Nobody's life is in vain or nothing that you go through is in vain. It's, it's all for good reason. And one day it'll be revealed to you. My advice for somebody who's dealing or struggling with drugs or alcohol would definitely be to talk to somebody who can help you and your doctor. You can't do it by yourself. Let somebody know. You don't have to be by yourself. Um, so in the case of anybody that still may be actively using or beginning a pattern of addiction, the most important thing is harm reduction. Um, knowing where resources are, things like Narcan, which can reverse an overdose, um, things like clean syringes, cotton, antiseptic wipes, anything as small can go forth to prevent at least some form of infection, abscess, even death. Um, so that's the most important thing. And the other thing that I would say is also a facet of that is knowing where to go for help, that there are free programs, um, there are meetings, there's groups, there's clinics, there's medications, um, things like methadone, Suboxone, Vivitrol, they're all out there. So just know where those resources are for when the time comes because there is a greater chance that you will leave the life of addiction than there is that you will stay in it as long as you can keep yourself alive. Admit you have a problem, go to your friends and family, they love you, they'll help you, and, um, and get the help. There's, lot, there's help out there, uh, and uh, you will get better. You will get better, and it's awesome. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you can do it, man. Just uh, 
But friends and family are going to be the only ones that your real friends and your real family are going to be the only ones that that will help because they understand and love you. And uh, so that's the first step. Admit you have a problem, open up to your friends and family, and then you take it from there, and uh, and and stick to it, and um, stay strong, and you'll be all right. Will you hear them? Anytime you, a family member or a friend, are losing control, talk to someone. Find someone who will hear you. Talk to a family member or a true friend about your addiction. Talk to your doctor or a counselor. Addiction is a disease that is curable. There are many programs available in your community that can help people get off drugs. Don't play with fire. Get the help you need or help a friend or a family member get the help they need.